It's been a good weekend. It's about to go to the whole next level. I told you before I went on my holidays, I'm starting to lay concrete, um, foundational pieces that I believe will be the stepping stones for us as a church to go from the number of people that we have now to in the next few months, sh- months, to over 400, which God told us about in the cave, and to spread and to start planting churches and to repurpose churches. We have not got the days to mess around. I have got not another 10 years to play games. Uh, we're in this thing boots and all, and um, for that we give God the glory. Um, some of the key things, if you've been part of this uh, church for any length of time, uh, foundational to us is this, that we are a house of prayer. Yeah. And we will pray, and we'll pray, and we'll pray a whole lot more until God shows up and does what he's promised to do, and then we'll pray some more, and we'll pray some more until God does some more. Uh, we've hammered it home, I've had it home so many times, and it, I've been reminded again tonight, um, just before the service, around the culture of honour. We're here to love each other. By this will all men know that we're his disciples if we love one another. We can move in signs and wonders. And if we don't have low love for each other, the people in the world will go, well, they're just like the clairvoyants then. The thing that marks the church of God out is its love for Christ and its love for each other. And then we looked just before I went away on holiday at the whole uh, thing about legacy. And I believe in all of my heart, God has brought many of you to this place, not just to do something for now, but to deposit something for the future. And that there will be many that will stand upon your shoulders because of what God is allowing you to do in these moments and these hours and these days. But I wanted to bring another foundational piece, and I think this is just equally as important to the prayer, to the culture of honour, to the legacy that we're going to try and build through this house by the grace of God. And that's for us to be wise stewards of what God has placed in us. We go again to look at the life of David. We've been looking at it. This is part 15. We've used this verse every time. There's a, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. This has really helped me, especially dealing with some of you pastorally, because we're not all in the same season, are we? And sometimes you get frustrated with people, but actually we need to understand what season they're in. And uh, some people need some more support at times than others. Um, sometimes you want to rattle people till they rattle, don't you? Do you know what I mean? Grab them and give them a good shaking and say, get on with it. But, you know, there's sometimes that we have to deal gently with people and encourage them. And um, so seasons are incredibly important. And the last couple of times we looked at the seasons of the outworking of God in David's life where the very throne that God had given to him was under threat. And David really didn't realise And he came to realise in the end that the battle belongs to the Lord. What God has promised you, you don't need to fight for. If it was really God that promised you. In fact, fighting for yourself is just a lack of trust in God. And uh, we need to grab hold of that idea very, very strongly. And then last Sunday morning, we come to that wonderful verse. David was, Absalom was now dead, but David was estranged from the throne. And the leaders and the elders in Jerusalem brought this wonderful word. Has nobody got a word about bringing back the king? And we said last Sunday morning, you know, we've been waiting for Jesus to come back. He's been waiting for us to call upon him to come back. You know, he's been waiting for his church to get herself ready. He's not coming back for an ugly bride with bulletproof glasses (laughs) and a bad perm. He's coming back for a beautiful bride without spot, wrinkle and blemish. And we need to make ourselves ready. But that's on one side. Tonight I want to talk about Stewardship through, through this, the season, the season of trying to work out of our natural resources rather than relying on what God has given us. Trying to work it out ourselves rather than let God do what God does best. Now the anger of the Lord burnt against Israel and incited David against them to say, go number the Israelites and the Ju- uh, people from Judah And the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, go about now through all the tribes of Israel to Dan, to Beersheba, and register the people, that I might know how many people there are. Now this seems reasonable in the light of God prodding David and inciting him for David to try and understand what he's got. 
There were, total quality management was something that they used to talk about when I worked for BT, TQM. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. That's what they used to say. And I guess this was in the heart of David. He wants to understand how many fighting men has he got? How many women has he got? How many children has he got? Who's on his side? So it doesn't seem an unreasonable thing, does it? And you know what? It wasn't an unreasonable thing because God had already laid down a process for that to happen. You know, we need to get back to the heart of what God says about certain things. Not everything that we dive into is wrong, but sometimes God has already purposed and planned a way to do what God has laid on our heart to do. And um, in Exodus 30 and verse 12, it says, when they take a census of the Israelites to count them, each one of them must pay the Lord a ransom for the life at the time he is counted. Then no play will come on them when you number them. So in that day and time, if you owned a thousand sheep, it was your God-given right to count your sheep. If you had 40, 50 slaves, it was your God-given right to count and number your slaves. But it was nobody else's right. And I want to see this, you to see this very, very clearly here tonight. That David was taking a census of that which did not belong to him. Israel did not belong to David. Israel belonged to God. I'll get there. Sounds a bit harsh, I know. So we need to see that the resources that God has placed in our keeping do not belong to us. God is the owner of all things and we are just the stewards of what he entrusts into our hands. I say this very often at funerals, but it, it's the truth of God's word, isn't it? We bring nothing into this world. We take nothing out. So between the day that we are born and the day that we breathe our last, that which God places in our hands is just borrowed for a season. It is entrusted to us. This is what the scripture says. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. We need to hold things lightly. How precious we become, don't we? about things in our lives, as if they truly do belong to us. You hear ministers go around talking about my church and this, that and the other, like as if it's their church. Well, Pastor Steve, how many people have you got in your church? I haven't got anybody in my church. I'm a steward of those that he's given me responsibility for here in Sedgley, but I own nothing. I, I'm just take, playing my part as the under-shepherd of which Christ has placed into my hands by his grace. At the age of 13, 14, God spoke a word over my life that I've been prophetic voice to my own generation. I take that not for granted. That's the investment of God, not something that I've earned or deserve. And it's come through powerfully, hasn't it, already tonight. It's by grace. What God is doing is, is all by grace. He's entrusted us in things in our lives for a season, for our time. So the church is not the place for the boss and servant type mentality. We are all servants of the Most High God. And I'm not going to go over that old ground as we've done the last few weeks, but Jesus himself was a supreme example of the servant king. who saw equality with God, something not to be grasped, but made himself as a servant. We need to see this very, very clearly tonight that you are responsible to use what God has given to you productively. That is your call and mission in this world. As God has saved us, he's equipped us, he's put an anointing upon us, whatever words you want to use. He has done that for his divine purpose. Everything was made for him and by him. It's all for his glory, it's all for his honour, and it's all for the extension of his kingdom. 
how some churches and some leaders have got this so, so wrong. Because it's all about them. It's all about their self-styledness. I know Pete but made fun of me this morning, talking about my chest collapsing. <laughs> I docked his ministry gift as he left the church. <laughs> no, we didn't. But I, 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 want, I, want you to, I want you to know that there are, there are churches uh, right across this nation following a model that is all about image. And we're all about stewardship. Because God looks it on the heart. Only you know tonight what truly God has invested in you. And it's not just come by, it's not just come by grace gifts. I mean, we talk very often about anointings and mantles and blessings that God places in us. But how about the stuff he's worked in us through some of the hard times? What the enemy meant for evil, we sung it this morning, and he's turned it for our good. There's been an investment even in the valley. And the Bible tells us to comfort those with the comfort that we've been given. There's, there's a, a level to which we can minister to people in a way that we never would have before if we hadn't to walk through some of the dark times that we walked through. So we, we need to understand that we are stewards of everything that God is doing in us and through us. He has made an investment in our lives. And he's no place for bosses or slaves. It would be so easy for me to kick some people around because they don't suit my agenda. We're all the same. Listen, don't believe I don't have thoughts and I want it done my way. But this is not a Frank Sinatra church. This is his church. <laughs> and now the end is near. <laughs> it's not to find the final curtain. When, when, you know, the curtain's already been ripped into. The, the curtain's done with... Uh, we're waiting for the trumpet. But now the end is near, and, and there comes an accountability. We've talked about it as a leadership team, and Shirley and I often talk about it. If we are to see the revival that God has promised us, there's going to be a whole sense of holiness come upon the people of God. And a lot of it becomes to do, to do with stewardship and individual accountability to what Christ is doing in us. This is not an easy word to preach. It's not, it, 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 it gets to the very core of who we are. But it's all about his grace, isn't it, in our lives? See, David may have been the king. That was definitely his calling. We've seen that, haven't we, as Samuel anoints him with oil and calls him out. But because of his kingship, certain things happen. You know, when you become the king, you know, when our queen dies, uh, Charles will inherit a whole lot of stuff that he doesn't have at the moment. That he doesn't, he can't get his hands on. But you know, just some of those decision-making powers, whatever the crown has, and all of those royal properties and everything else, will become to him, and he will be stewards over them. Very, very important that we understand that. And David was given this position by God, but God had invested him something just for the season. So I want you to start to hold things a lot more lightly, some of you, than you do. We can be some, so proud of what we've built, what we've achieved, what we've accomplished. But it's all by the grace of the Lord. It always, always, always will be by the grace of the Lord. With that level of responsibility comes a great accountability. And I, Looking on in Scripture, I think Solomon, his son, actually learnt and understood from his father. Solomon says this, Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern such a great people as yours? Then God answers him, because you've asked them for this thing and have not asked for yourself, not for long life nor riches for yourself, or you've asked for, life for, your, uh, asked for the life of your enemies, but you've asked for yourself discernment and understanding and justice. Behold, I will do according to your words. Behold, I will give you a wise and discerning heart. There'll be no one like you before you or after you. And you will arise. No one will arise like you after you. And basically what he's saying to Solomon, he asked for the wisdom to be a wise steward of what has been placed in your hands. I think sometimes we ask for a whole lot more anointing and actually, 
We just need a whole lot more wisdom. God has incredibly gifted this church. I am so amazed by the people God has brought even over these last 12, 18 months. The quality of the people, Pete but said to me, the quality of the people in your church is outstanding. This is the doing of God. But I believe God has brought people here, not so that we can sit here, but we can, we can take what has been put in us and as wise stewards, go and multiply that to a generation that desperately needs Christ. This town needs winning for Jesus. And while we keep to ourselves what we have invested in us, we're never going to get to that place. So legacy is important. The culture of honour is important. But being incredibly wise stewards of the gifts God has given to us are really important. And I'm imploring you as your pastor and leader here that you would use what God has placed in your heart and do it with all of your might. And get on with the job that's in front of us. Never mind about a title. Never mind about a badge. You ain't going to get one of them here anyway. Forget it. We ain't even got enough car parking spaces, let alone put one with pastor's name written on there. Just get here early if you want to pay. <laughs> Solomon asked for the resource that would not enhance his pockets, but would bless the people of God. I think we need to let that sink into our hearts as well, that what God has invested in us is not for us. It's for others. It's for the service of our King and it's for the blessing of those that we have come to love in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians tells us this, if a man builds on the foundation with gold, silver and precious stones, with wood, hay and straw, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If a man's work which he has built on remains, he will receive a reward. The teachings of Jesus were incredibly strong. And one of the things that Jesus was always teaching was this. Don't store up treasure here on earth. It's not about here. It is about here, but it's also about there. But store up for yourself treasure in heaven where nobody can steal it or moth can make it disappear. God is looking for us to be wise stewards and one day he will repay us. The scripture says he will repay each person according to what we have done. Your salvation is secure. Put that to one side. We're not talking about that issue. By grace you've been saved and through faith. And it's not of yourself, it's the gift of God. And as far as judgment for your sin is concerned, Calvary's covered it all. We sing it and we believe it. But there is coming a judgment for the people of God, just as Jesus taught in the parable of the talents, where the king is going to call us forward and say, what did you do with that which I invested in your life? Well, I knew you were hard and I dug it in the ground. And Like David, we need to see that God has entrusted stuff to us that we need to be using to the glory of the master and to the blessing of others. Now David's heart was troubled after he'd numbered the people. So the Lord said to David, you've sinned greatly. And he says, but now if it pleases the Lord, take away your iniquity from your servant have acted foolishly. He came to this conclusion, actually I need to sort myself out. You can always tell when people haven't really got the concept of servanthood or being wise stewards. They will often use these words, me, me, and mine. We often sing when the music fades, we're coming back to the heart of worship. I think that would be also applicable when we start to think about our stewardship before God. We need to strip it back and look right into our hearts and see what God has invested in us and say, am I truly using what God has given me? Now, I understand the frustration of certain people in certain churches because I've been in churches where it's almost like the congregation has been held back by five or six really talented leaders. Well, he ain't got any of them here, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> it's almost like those people take the preeminence and there is no room for you to do what you... Listen, that's not the church we've built here. That's not the body that we've intended and set out to build here. We are making room for you to serve God. And I don't want you to do what you can't do. 
I want you to do what God has laid on your heart to do. It's incredibly important. And then don't dismiss it just because it seems as a small thing. God will use us together, and we've looked at this picture as the body. The body needs every single moving part that it can get. And you need to take your place. And if we all take our place, we're not going to get worn out. Have you noticed, you, know, you, you get yourself a broken leg, it puts a whole lot of strain on the other leg that's not broken. And the problem with the body of Christ is become so fragmented and disabled in so many ways, there's been like a third of the church having to run five times faster just to keep the thing going. And it's not even moving forward at that, it's just, just taking, you know, treading water. I believe it's time for the bride to make herself ready for us to position ourselves in the body of Christ, to be wise stewards of what God has invested in us, so as together we will stand an exceeding great army and accomplish the purpose of God here in this place. That is what God is calling us to. But I'm challenging to you to your own personal stewardship. Some of you are square pegs in round holes. No longer. Don't do it. God has been preparing many of us over a long season. I talk to Shirley quite often about this. But you know, God's been preparing Shirley a lifetime to get here. You heard what Pete said over Steve this morning. God has prepared Steve. For, listen, we, we, it's, been, it's been a long battle for some of us. But I'm glad that we're here today. And I'm glad God is saying what he's saying. And we will not go back. We will push on for what God has got for us. We will do what God is asking us to do. God is really asking you to get on with it. I've said this to the music team, and I'm not singling them out. I'm going to single out the preachers out in a minute, but I've said to the music team, their job is not to get every note of music right. Just as well. <laughs> Confession is always good for the soul. Eric. I would rather they be substandard musically and passionate worshippers of God. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying they're substandard musically, but I'm, what I'm saying is I, I'd, I'd rather they be substandard musically and passionate worshippers of Christ. Well, because we, we didn't come here for a concert. We come here to unlock heaven. You heard it this morning. The part of the, the whole essence of worship is that we bring the presence of God among us because he inhabits the praises of his people, doesn't he? And inhabiting the praises of the people, you know, God begins to move. Faith begins to rise in our hearts. I'll say it to the preachers as well. We've got plenty of them. It's not your job to go around to these churches and impress everybody with how articulate and clever you are. I love what Paul says. I did not come to you with wise and persuasive words, but I come in the Spirit's power. Our job is for impartation. I'm learning this more and more. I'm not interested in giving you a nice sermon. I don't care if it's sometimes whether it doesn't completely make sense to you. Sometimes it don't make sense to me and I'll write them. <laughs> but I want you to walk away with a sense that God has spoken to you. That's a nice little word. I don't want it to be a nice little word. Get a nice little word. I can read that in Word for Today every morning. Bob Glass has made a fortune and write that stuff. God bless him. I'm not criticising you. But you know what I'm trying to say, don't you? You know, you get a word for today off the internet. I, I want God to stir us as his people. You know, in the worship and in the preaching of his word, these are incredibly important things. You know, God's judgment came on David and on Israel because of um, his actions in, in um, looking to his own resources rather than the resources of God. But aren't you glad that God, we've heard it as well, thank you Paul, that God is always the God of the second chance. Yeah. And uh, he sends his prophet, thank God for the prophetic word. Yeah. And um, through the prophet, David is told to build an altar. And he goes to this, this Jezbedite, whatever you want to call him, too many odd words in the Old Testament for me by far. And he says to him, I want to buy this piece of land you've got, and I want to build an altar on it. And the guy says, you're all right, David, you're the king, you can have it for free. And these incredible, powerful words, no, I will surely buy it from you for the price you have set. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord, my God, which have cost me nothing. Yeah. Whoa. Ain't that a word? 
I will surely buy it from you at a price, for I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. There is a cost coming to the church of Jesus Christ. It's no longer easy, easy believism. I believe the days are going to come, and surely as day follows night, persecution is going to come to the church of Jesus in our nation. But I tell you what, when we praise him in the dark of the hard times, it's so precious because it's costing us something. Let me encourage you. Bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. With your tears rolling down your face, praise God. We were talking about it as a family the other day. You know, it's so much different when you go to a Christian's funeral. But one of the worst, best worship services we've ever been in was my granddad's funeral. With the tears rolling down our faces, we praise God. We praised him with all that we've got. You know, we need sometimes to bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. In our brokenness and in our troubles, let the tears flow down your face. I will not give God a sacrifice that has cost me nothing. Too much of that going on. You can manufacture that sort of stuff. We'll all get you jumping up and down and rename our church something trendy. I've been a marketeer, I'm not going down that rabbit trail. <laughs> You're tempting me now, aren't you? But I'm not. I am not going down that rabbit trail. I've been in marketing all my life. I understand why people want to rename churches. So, but listen, we're not into marketing. We're into preaching the gospel. And it's an offence, and it gets on people's noses. Not, you know, what as Claire said to me, you know, our neighbours around the corner who Claire walks to school with every day. She said, you know what? They don't care what our church is called. They just need Jesus. Whether you call it St. Paul's, whether you call it St. Matthew's, whether you call it Sedgwick Community Church, whether you call it Glasgow Elim, they have not got a clue, but they need Christ. It's not what we call it. It's what happens on the inside here and how we go out and manifest the presence of God from this place that, that really counts, you know. Bless the Lord. It says, then David built an altar there to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. I think some of you tonight, I, I genuinely believe this, need to make peace with God. Just just over your, your position, not in church, but just who you are. I know a lot of us struggle with who we are. I know a lot of people look at me and go, he, he must not have a care in the world. You know, Claire says my heart's like a swinging brick and I'm horizontal. Oh, that's, 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 that's not totally true. It's not totally true. And, and I, I, I guess there's, there's people like me that are kind of more extrovert and kind of less melancholic than others that you see bands. But listen, we, if we're all honest, and some of the prophetic words that came over me, I really didn't appreciate um, because they unlocked my heart and, and just shone the torch in there again. And we'd like everybody to think we're really strong. But listen, we all know, don't we? And I've said to you, what I am under the anointing is not what I am. All that I am is by his grace. And, and we, we need to look deep into our hearts and truly understand. And, and I think this, I'm going to pray in a minute that, that we pray, some, pray an offering of peace upon our lives. That we might come to peace with God about who we are in order that we just might feel that liberty to serve him. I, I think some people in church really struggle because they just don't know how to fit or they don't know where they fit or they feel that something that God has called them to is far too big for them. Listen, whatever God has laid upon your heart and invested in you, he's big enough to perform it in you. There's callings and mantles and gifts on some of you that you're yet to realise. But you will never fully walk into them until you are faithful in the smaller things. There's some of you that are called to preach to thousands more people than I am. But until you're prepared to serve other people and wash their feet, you've got no open bobo. You know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to be honest with you. The amount of people have come to me and I, and I look at them with tears in my eyes and they go, God's called me to this. I know he's called it to you. But if you're not faithful in the few things, he's not going to give you the big things. It's never going to happen. So if I come to one or two of you and just in love just say, look, would you do this? Don't ever think that's below me. Don't ever think it's below me. We heard yesterday that prayer changes things. Yeah. 
But in our, in our praying, as in the book of Romans, we need to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Pleasing to God, which is our... Scripture says it's reasonable. It's not unreasonable to give God back our lives to which he's given us and all that he's invested in us. And lay again our lives on the altar and say, God, here I am. In my faults, in my failures, in my brokenness. But you're still chosen by your grace to save me. And you've invested in me some stuff. And I don't want to let it go to rack and ruin. Some of you have received so much from God. In, in terms of the longevity of your service for Christ, you have so much experience to give. Don't ever take that for granted. We need a fresh to lay ourselves again on the altar. And our prayer today is, God, help us to be wise stewards. That not only will we see our church change, that our lives change, but we'll see our society changed forever. I don't think this world is looking particularly for miracles. I think it's looking for people who've got lives that are sorted. Because there's so many people out there in such a bad state. They're everywhere, aren't they? Yeah. Hopeless. Kids in here on Friday night scared to death. People dressing up as clowns. The, the, the enemy is trying to come in. But like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord is going to raise up a standard against him. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of you have belittled what God's put in you as well. If I'm honest. Said, well, God's only invested that small. Listen, just keep on using it. Keep on using it. God's going to multiply it. You see some great, some great ministries around the world. They didn't start off as great ministries. But they took what God had invested in their lives and they just carried on with God. We have to play our part. I believe there's a whole lot more resource yet to come into church. I believe there are people from other nations that we've not even met yet that are on their way. I believe there are backslidden people who've got so much gifting they don't even realise it. And actually they're robbing us by being here so they better get back with God again and get here quick. There's whole sorts of stuff going to go on. But I'm not preaching to them tonight. I'm preaching to the converted. I am preaching to the choir because I want you to stand with me and be a wise steward of what God has placed in you that we might get this job done. Can we just bow our heads? I just believe they, they use a word, don't they? This is a game changer. Prayer's a game changer. The culture of honour's a game changer. Getting ourselves to invest in others in terms of legacy is a game changer. But I believe being wise stewards of what God has invested in us is incredibly important to the life of this church and to your growth in God. And the devil hates it. He'll do anything from letting you do what God has called you to do and invest in your spirit. It will crush you at any given time. He's a liar. Even as I've been speaking, the enemy's come in and told you, you're not good enough. Oh, you've just dreamed that up. God never really said that to you. <laughs> That's the first lie of the Bible, wasn't it? Did God really say? If you're, if you're in them kind of thoughts, that's the devil. Did God really say? You know, your spirit bears witness with your spirit. Your sheep hear his voice. You know it's God. Yet the enemy will come and try to rob you of it. Lord, tonight I just pray in this moments that we have together. We thank you for this incredible weekend of, of teaching and uh, blessing. Uh, but Lord, as, as we draw it to a close, and we want to start this week with a, with a fresh encounter with you. And, 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 a, and a new desire to serve you out of being wise stewards. You talk about the wise and the foolish builders. You talk about the wise and the foolish virgins. And all, in all of those stories, Lord, that the wisdom was to do with stewardship. 
for doing the right thing and hearing your voice and implementing your plan, not our plan. God, forgive us for the times when we walk around and trying to work out how much national resource we've got to sort out problems when you've already placed into our hands that which we need. And help us to work together so intrinsically as the body of Christ here that the enemy cannot get a foothold. That as we dwell together in unity, there you will command the blessing. And it won't just like be like some blessing. It'd be like the oil that's poured over Aaron's head, like a bucket of oil that they used to pour over the high priest's head that would just come down his beard and down his robes and hit the ground. It would be so treacle-like. God, that's the kind of anointing that we're after, Lord. So bring us to that place, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you.